So I'm going to talk about user tracking on academic publisher platforms. Um, before I, I go too far, I just want to acknowledge um, a lot of colleagues who have helped uh, sharpen my work here over the past couple of months, um, either through conversations, editing, or through their own uh, work in, in similar areas. I also want to tell you that I have a lot that I'm going to try to get through here in a short time, and I do want to have time for questions. So if you want to, he to read a lot more about what, uh, what I'm talking about here, I've got something online here. I'll put this link at the end of the talk as well. Um, I'll also put the slides there, and uh, this talk is being recorded, so it will be available on the CNI site. Um, I'll also put it on, on my site here as well. So uh, I could go into great detail and left my own devices, I would. Um, so lest we run out of time, I want to give you the highlights, the key findings here up front. And I know, I apologize for those of you in the back, the type is small here. So uh, I'm going to give you a, a short rundown here. Um, I found uh, that the articles most frequently used by patrons at the University of Minnesota include code on their publisher pages that is designed to identify users and to link their identity to the pages that they visit. Uh, I found that these tools derive user identity in part through metadata that is not currently governed by our typical definition of personally identifiable information. And uh, the conclusion that I have come to is that I do not believe that it is currently possible to ensure that use of electronic library resources can be private. Uh, so I'll talk you through that now. <laughs> A little bit of background. So I mentioned the, the December CNI meeting. Uh, there were three talks there that were uh, really impactful for me in, uh, in, in this work. Uh, the first was um, a talk from Kenning Arlich and Scott Young, um, where uh, based on an article that they had written uh, with some colleagues, where they did some automated analysis of library homepage source code, uh, looking for the presence and proper implementation of privacy protection measures. Um, the second was a talk by Micah Altman, uh, Lisa Janicki Hinchliffe, and uh, Katie Zimmerman, um, uh, where they did a very detailed analysis of publisher platform terms of service and also uh, looked at some web tracking mechanisms. Um, and the third uh, was a talk by Todd Carpenter from NISO, Gene Shipman of Elsevier, and Ralph Youngen from ACS about RA21. Um, and there was a, a, a moment in that talk that really crystallized this project for me. And that was um, when, in response to questions from a bunch of dudes um, about, uh, about privacy and RA21, um, Todd Carpenter, in an attempt to reassure us that RA21 was not, in fact, a grab for personally identifiable information, said, and this is a paraphrase, publishers don't need RA21 to identify users. So this was intended to, to allay our concerns. Um, I left the room concerned. Um, so here's what I did when I got home to Minneapolis. Um, in January and February of this year, um, I embarked on a, a very simple study trying to answer the question, can an analysis of the source code of publisher platform pages, much like the folks at Montana State did, um, provide evidence of if and how publishers can identify library users? to prove uh, if, if uh, Todd's, Todd Carpenter's statement was, was in fact true? The answer is yes. Um, and here's how I, how I went about this. I looked at the 100 most frequently accessed articles at the University of Minnesota. So we record DOIs that pass through our easy proxy server and have for a couple of years. And so I took the 100 DOIs that appeared most frequently in our easy proxy logs over a couple of years. Um, and. Uh, those 100 articles came from 15 different publisher platforms. Um, as an aside, I think the fact that there were only 15 platforms represented in the 100 most frequently used articles at our library is its own problem that is probably worth uh, further conversation, but I don't have time today. Um, for those 15 platforms, I took one representative article, the most frequently accessed article from that platform in our, in our logs. Um, I resolved the DOI through doi.org uh, from an on-campus IP that's part of our uh, authentication range with each of those publishers. 
I captured a complete archive of the page, including the first and third party assets and all code and scripts that come along with it. Um, I read the source code to the best of my ability. I will note that one platform that I looked at at random uh, shipped over 60,000 lines of JavaScript to the browser. Um, so that's why I say to the best of my ability. And then I analyzed the live page with Ghostery. Um, you may have heard of Ghostery before. It's a very uh, handy web browser. There are others like it, sorry, web extension, rather browser extension. There are others like it, but what it does is allow you to block uh, known web trackers. Um, and so here's a, a screenshot of Ghostery running on the website that my team maintains, just to show you that my hands aren't entirely clean. Um, Ghostery finds these third-party assets and blocks them if you, want, if you want it to. I set Ghostery to not block anything, but instead just to use its sort of user-friendly display of the third-party um, code on the page. This is, I, I want to emphasize how simple <laughs> this research was. This is well within the grasp of any library staff member. Um, here's what I found. I found that on average, each of the 15 platforms had 18 third-party assets being loaded on their article page. The median was 10. There was one that had none. If there's anyone here from Inform Pubs Online, kudos um, on having no trackers on your platform. One had over 100. Um, and I found a total of 139 distinct third-party uh, asset sources across these 15 platforms. What is the significance of, of third-party code? Why do I care about it? Why am I looking for it? Um, JavaScript that is loaded onto a web page can access the following things, the page address, the page contents, user actions on the page, browser info, the user IP address, um, contents of existing browser cookies, I'll get into that. JavaScript can also load, Java, load additional JavaScript from other sources. Um, when you're talking about the page address, the page contents, user actions on the page, in the context of a scholarly article, uh, this reads to me as, in, in sort of ALA Patron Bill of Rights parlance, as information being sought, or uh, this is uh, one half of what we try very hard to protect. User behavior, um, user interests, user research, um, we try to protect that when it is combined with user identity information. Um, so under our fairly common understanding, at least it's true at my institution, of what constitutes personally identifiable information, this isn't a big deal. We don't consider IP addresses to be personally identifiable. Um, I think there's argument for reconsidering that, but um, by loading third-party JavaScript, publisher platforms are effectively sharing the content of user research inquiries with third parties, along with information that can and I uh, would say will, be used to specifically identify the user, to bring those two things together that makes us something that we uh, typically would try to protect. So how, how does this work? Um, let's take the example of Facebook. Four of the 15 platforms included Facebook code on their page. Um, and so on sites with Facebook code on the page, we can assume that the identity of users with a Facebook cookie in their browser. That means if you use the remember me on this computer or save my login function, um, that when users with a live Facebook cookie in their browser visit a publisher page that has Facebook code loaded on it, their visit to that page is going to be stored and attributed to their Facebook identity. Um, you may have recall in, a couple of months ago in the news, uh, Mark Zuckerberg testifying on Capitol Hill about, and there were questions about shadow profiling um, as a, um, a practice that Facebook was doing. This is um, creating profiles for people who do not have Facebook accounts based on information from other sources. Um, <clears throat> and because of some of the information that came out around that hearing, we can assume that on sites with Facebook code, users without a Facebook cookie in their, in their browser, um, that the information about the page that they are visiting is likely being combined with a shadow profile or being used to create a shadow profile um, behind the scenes. Google, 14 of the 15 publisher platforms included Google code. Um, likewise here, we can assume that on sites with Google code, um, the identity of users, if you have a live Google cookie in your browser, your identity is going to be combined with the information about the page that you're visiting and stored by Google. And um, 
I'm trying very hard to keep this as factual as possible and to point out when I'm editorializing or making assumptions. Here's an assumption that I'm making. I assume that the same holds true for users without a Google cookie. Um, how does that happen? How does, how does a shadow profile get created and how do you get information about your identity stored even when you don't have an account or a live login with one of these third parties? One way is through browser fingerprinting. Um, this may be a technique that you are uh, familiar with. But if not, um, I'll just mention that it's a way to generate a unique identifier for a user when you don't know their login information. You d they don't have an account with you. Um, and it takes metadata from your web browser that is sent by default to the web server and effectively creates a hash of it. Th some, you know, especially if you work in digital preservation, you may know about um, cryptographic hashes as a way to uniquely identify digital items. Um, and that's what's going on here. So it's taking what looks like very benign information, and when it's combined together, it becomes remarkably identifying. So as an example, um, this is a screenshot of my visit with the browser that I use most frequently to the uh, EFF Panopticlick site, um, where it showed that of the visitors to their page in the, in the past 45 days, my browser matched only one in over 100,000 browsers. Um, it's, my browser is fairly unique. I'm not doing anything too interesting um, to, to make it so, but um, I will point out, I'm going to go back here, I will point out that if you do things like enable do not track or install privacy protecting plugins to your browser, it just makes your browser more unique and makes you um, easier to track, unfortunately. Um, Browser fingerprinting and this kind of shadow profiling are not just the province of major social networks and ad networks. Um, there's a, a class of tools, I'll refer to them as audience tools, you may have hear them referred to as uh, data management platforms or digital marketing platforms. Um, and in fact, the, the title of our session comes from a promotional video from one of these tools where they talk about how they, you know, collecting, correlating, stitching, enriching, it's about how they combine these tiny bits of data um, and metadata with other data sources with the express purpose of deriving user identity. Um, I don't expect you to read this, this is just an illustration. Um, so uh, here's a company called Newstar, um, <clears throat> and a, a couple of, of things from this page. Um, <clears throat> In today's connected world where consumers move rapidly across devices and touch points, it's time to stop guessing and start knowing with accurate and verified customer identity data. Over 150 million households compiled, verified, and enhanced with 450 plus fields of demographic, behavioral, financial, property, segmentation, and geographic assets. At least four of the 15 platform, publisher platform pages included Newstar code. Um, Newstar uh, claims that their uh, one ID system, their profiles for users, um, are re-corroborated every 15 minutes and that they collect 11 billion points of data um, every day. So that's one of these audience tools or data management platforms. This is a screenshot from a marketing video for another tool called Adobe Audience Manager. You'll, you'll just note that um, this shows a screenshot of their demographic screen with age and income level. Um, also, uh, spaces here for gender, purchases, social, um, at least six of the 15 publisher platforms included Adobe Audience Manager code. Uh, Adobe claims that Audience Manager can turn fragmented data from any channel or device into meaningful audiences that you can act on right away. Um, <clears throat> can be used to deliver offers only to users when they are logged in or based on previous login activity. So when someone is not logged into your platform, you still know who they are. Um, and they advertise their ability to enrich the data that you collect with uh, data uh, purchased from other brokers such as Axiom, which has comprehensive consumer data on approximately 250 million US addressable consumers. Um, that's pretty much everybody. Uh, the third of these audience tools or digital marketing platforms that I'll mention is Oracle Marketing Cloud. Four of the 15 publisher platforms included Oracle Marketing Cloud code. Um, like these others, they are very proud of their ability to connect a user across devices and across sessions. Um, they claim that their Oracle ID graph can reach over 90% of the people online in the US. Um, 
And where do these data management platforms get the information that they use to build these data sets? The metadata, the browser fingerprints, things like that. Um, well, at least some of it comes from our patrons' use of library resources. Um, 11 of the 15 publisher platforms included a tool called Add This. Add This is a script that gathers information about the user and their activity and shares it with a network of over 40 different advertisers and data brokers, including Newstar, Adobe, Oracle, and Google. So publisher platforms send data to these data brokers who then use it to help publishers and ad networks to better identify and target users on publisher platforms. I've now mentioned six of the 139 different um, sources of third-party code that I found on these 15 platforms. Any of these 139 tools is technically capable to similarly surveil users, and we have to assume that many are. Um, so this is the complete list of the Add This partners as of February, um, uh, highlighting the, the ones that I've, I've previously talked about. I'll note that as of yesterday, uh, New Star's site featured a story about uh, Aetna's successful use of their technology. Um, and I'll note here that the top 100 articles that I started with at the beginning of this study included topics like childhood obesity and cancer treatment. Um, and I don't expect that our users anticipate that their research on health topics will ultimately be used to create a profile on them that will be shared with their insurance company. Likewise, um, do, our, do our users expect their research behavior to be shared with eBay and combined with their bidding activity? Um, Samsung is a partner here. Um, do they expect their research behavior to be shared with the manufacturer of their television for the purpose of better showing them ads on the television home screen. There's at least one publisher platform that directly included Samsung um, advertising code on their page. At least one platform included code from LinkedIn. Do our users expect that their research behavior is going to be used to help target advertisements to them in their career networking site? So I do not believe that it is possible for use of licensed resources to be private. Um, the tiny bits of information that are uh, being sent to dozens of third-party platforms every time our users access an article will be used to identify them. Our idea of personally identifiable information has been totally outstripped by Moore's Law and cheap storage, so that now we have to assume that every tiny bit of information that can be collected about a user will be collected about a user and will sit latent until it can be, until enough information can be aggregated around it that that user can be personally identified. So I am really heartened to see some recent sort of institutional attention being given to this new privacy landscape. Um, ALA Patron Bill of Rights Article 7 was approved at midwinter. Um, this reads as pretty aspirational to me, um, given what I've looked at here, uh, because I think it's fairly safe to say that we are not presently protecting privacy and safeguarding user data, library use data, rather. Likewise, the Stanford statement that, uh, that David referenced earlier, this is an excellent statement, it is powerful. What I don't know is, that if, is if it's true, at least in the sense of a present tense of reject because unless the code that's being shipped to the signatories of this letter, which it's possible it could be, um, but unless the code that's being shipped to users from their libraries is substantially different from what's being shipped to University of Minnesota libraries patrons, um, they are not, uh, uh, they, they are in fact silently exposing user data to third party interests. Um, I suspect that, you know, this, this uh, statement was intended to apply primarily to things like the Safari Books Online, to single sign-on, things like that, but um, it's broadly stated. Um, I'm going to go back here for just a second and just say, I am concerned when we tout our commitment to privacy and our values around privacy that we don't give our users a false sense of what the actual privacy landscape is. 
And I believe that we are in that position currently. Um, so there is some effort underway to build model license language around some of these concerns. So again, at um, uh, Lisa Janicki Hinchliff and Katie Zimmerman at uh, the December meeting talked a little bit about a, a nascent effort there that I'm really excited about. Um, I would finally just encourage all of you here, all of you listening at home in the future on the video, um, this is very easy to do. Um, and I think it will reveal a lot about the current landscape of your electronic resources. I would encourage you to take a look at it yourself. Um, and with that, uh, here's a link to the longer write-up, contact information. I will be around um, the rest of today and tomorrow. Happy to talk about this with anyone. And we've got time for questions. What time is it? 3.06.